The title of the message is Loved Before Time. It could have easily have been uh, Delightful Truths for the Believer in Jesus. And so I wanted to <coughs> uh, encourage you, uh, not that the whole of the scriptures are not encouraging, but in this special way today. The letter to the Ephesians was written to saved Gentiles like us, who the Jews believed to be unredeemable. So common was the belief that the I am God of the Old Testament belonged exclusively to the Jews that both races, races marveled that the Gentiles were being saved by faith in Jesus. The progression is always the same when God chooses to save a lost soul. He first convinces the person that they are separate from God without hope of heaven and that they deserve his wrath for having broken his law. And then he draws them to his son, Jesus, who was crucified, buried, and risen from the dead to secure their salvation. The change of heart and mind that salvation brings makes us uh, able to say amen to all that the Bible says about us. And particularly, uh, the particular text I have in mind is Ephesians 2 and 1 through 3, where Paul describes the reader's spiritual condition prior to their salvation, and it applies to us as well. It is not unfamiliar to any of you. But I draw your attention to it once again this morning. Chapter 2 and verses <clears throat> 1 through 3. And you, he is speaking to Christian Gentiles, believing Gentiles, you were dead to God in or because of your transgressions and sins in which you formerly walked or lived according to the course of this world according to the prince of the power of the air, of the spirit that is now working in the sons of disobedience. Among them we too all formerly lived for the lusts of our flesh, indulging the desires of the flesh and of the mind, and were by nature, meaning by birth, children of or children deserving wrath, even as the rest of humanity." And so he is speaking to Christians, reminding them of who they were before they were rescued by Jesus. They were spiritually dead. Now to be spiritually dead is to be separate from God because of sin. To be joined to God by faith in Jesus is to have eternal life. Uh, without him... Uh, to be without him is to experience the second death, which is eternal separation from God without remedy. And so everyone who is not a believer in Jesus is among what we call the walking dead, spiritually speaking. You see their lips move, their bodies move, they go throughout the day, they pursue a career, they rise up, they eat, they bathe, they do all the things that humans do, but as concerns God, they are dead to Him. Their spirits are separate from God because their sin has not been forgiven by faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. To be joined to God is life everlasting. To be separate from God is to abide in death. Secondly, in this passage we see the proof that all men are dead to God from birth is that they live to please themselves instead of God. If there is any religion in their lives, it is an afterthought. It is a, a situation of if there's enough time. It is just an attachment uh, to their lives so that they can say, yes, I worship God. The scripture tells us that we go astray from the womb speaking lies and loving sin until God chooses to save us by power and grace. 
We do not choose God. God chooses us. We do not and cannot love God. We love God only because He first loved us. Our love for Him is a response to His great love for us. The Gentile readers of this letter understood these truths as I am sure you do. The situation with them, as it is with all men, was hopeless, as you can see in those first three verses. But now we come to verse 4, and those two favorite words of ours, but God. We were in desperate shape. We were lost. We were hell-bound. We were prisoners and servants of sin, self, and Satan. And there was nothing we could do. There was nothing we wanted to do. We were headed for hell, but God. And that is the only reason, ladies and gentlemen, that we are saved today, is because God imposed Himself in our lives by power and by might. But God, being rich in mercy because of His great love with which He loved us even when we were dead in our transgressions. He made us alive together with Christ. By grace you have been saved. These are precious words indeed. Two words, but God. We can comfort ourselves with these words. Do you understand that in these two, two words you have the good news? Satan whispers in my ear and says, you've been a wretched guy. You've had an awful life and you're not so hot today even though you're a pastor and you claim to be a Christian. And I can say in my heart and in my mind and out loud, but God! But God intervened. God came into my life. God gave me a new heart. God raised me from the dead. He delivered me from slavery to Satan. Hallelujah. But God. You see, with men salvation is impossible. But with God all things are possible, including the resurrection of the spiritually dead. Secondly, we see that we are saved today because God is rich in mercy. He doesn't just trickle out His blessings, people. He pours them out upon the objects of His own choosing. We are saved today because God is rich in mercy, because of His great love with which He loved us even when we were His enemies. We are spiritually alive by faith in Christ because God made us alive by His sovereign, electing, adopting grace. Paul describes this grace in some detail beginning in Ephesians 1.1. I wanted to remind you of who we were and I want to remind you of what God has done to make us His children. Look at Ephesians 1 and let's read through verse 5. Ephesians 1, chapter, or verse 1. Paul, an apostle of Christ Jesus by the will of God, to the saints who are at Ephesus and who are faithful in Christ Jesus, grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Blessed or praise be to the God, to God our Father, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places in Christ. Verse 4 Just as He chose us in Him before the foundation of the world, that we would be holy and blameless before Him. In love He predestined us to adoption as sons through Jesus Christ to Himself according to the kind intention of His will, to the praise of the glory of His grace, which He freely bestowed upon us in the Beloved. Do you all believe that the Bible is the Word of God? Do you all believe it is infallible? That it is inspired, that it is breathed out of the mouth of God and recorded in this book, and that every word of it is true? Amen. I believe it, I believe you believe it, and so let's approach this passage like that. In verse 2, uh, uh, grace to you, says Paul, 
And what he is saying is that may the unearned, undeserved love and kindness of God be yours in great measure through faith in Christ Jesus. Grace to you, not, not law to you, not uh, legal demands to you, but grace to you, abundant grace based upon the, the uh, in, incredible mercy of God and the great love of God. In verse 3, Paul says, Praise be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us. The us refers to the saved Gentiles to whom the letter was written, uh, and to believers in every age. I think it's wonderful that Paul says us. He includes himself. He's a saved Jew, not a Gentile, but he says us. Why? Because the two have become one. There are no races in the kingdom of God. Jews and Gentiles are alike, and they are one in Jesus Christ. We were the people described in Ephesians 2, 1 through 3, slaves of the devil, deserving God's wrath instead of His mercy. And these Gentiles expressed their sin in various ways, just as we did. You want to go back and and, uh, get a taste of what we used to be? It's a little disturbing, and it'll cause us to blush. But let's take a look at 1 Corinthians 6, uh, 9 through uh, 11. We were the people described in Ephesians 2. And we expressed ourselves, expressed our sinfulness like the people around us do. And we shake our heads at them. Uh, We are uh, embarrassed by the the sinfulness in our land and in our world. But i got to tell you, folks, the Bible tells us such were some of you. 1 Corinthians chapter 6 and verse 9. This is a serious text of Scripture. It says this, Or do you not know that the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God? What does that mean? It means what we say in our bulletins. Each Sunday morning. You remember that? Uh, What does God, our Creator and Owner, require of us? Therefore you are to be perfect as your Heavenly Father is perfect. Can any man make himself perfect in the eyes of God? No. For whoever keeps the whole law and yet stumbles in one point, he's become guilty of all. He's damned and it's off to hell with him. That's every human on earth. There is no perfection in human flesh. So let's... Let's go back now and read this. Do you not know that the unrighteous, the imperfect, will not inherit the kingdom of heaven? Do not be deceived. And here's how we express our sinfulness. Neither fornicators, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor effeminate, nor homosexuals, nor thieves, nor the covetous, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor swindlers will inherit the kingdom of God. Elsewhere we're told that liars won't get in the kingdom of God. Such were some of you. I think we could read that. Such were all of you. If we're not looking at these specific things, maybe we didn't do these specific things. We probably thought of all these specific things at one time or another. Maybe we didn't lay our hands to every one of them. But such was the case with us. But we were washed. We were sanctified. We have been justified in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and in the Spirit of our God. We need to understand that when we see a homosexual march down the main street of some major city in our land, marching down vile and and filthy mouthed and half naked, they are no worse off than any other sinner on this planet. And the same blood that saved us can save them and wash them and cleanse them. They need the gospel and we need to take it to them. We need to rejoice in these truths so much that it just fills us up and overflows to the people around them. As it was with them, so it was with us. Even if our favorite sin is not listed, we were sinners all, but now 
We have been washed by the blood of Jesus. We have been set apart by God the Holy Spirit from the rest of humanity. Set apart to God. Having trusted in Christ, we have been justified. We have been made righteous in the eyes of God. And having been cleansed from all our sin, we have been reconciled to God. Rejoined to Him. Jesus took our sin upon Himself and gave us His righteousness. Indeed, He made us the very righteousness of God. We were dead, but now, having been joined to Him by faith in Christ, we are alive forevermore. And, says Ephesians 1.3, we declare with the Apostle Paul, Blessed or praised be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in heavenly places in Christ. Praise should ever be upon our lips. Thanksgiving should be flowing from our lips at every hour of every day for the grace that has been showered upon us. Ephesians 1.4 Ephesians 1.4 answers a critical question. Let me read the verse for you. Ephesians 1.4 Just as, I'll read 3 with it. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in heavenly places just as He chose us, that is, just as God chose us in Jesus before the foundation of the world that we should be holy and blameless before him. Outstanding. This verse answers the question. How have we come to possess all the blessings heaven can afford? And that's what verse 3 tells us. We have in our possession every blessing that belongs to our Father. He has bestowed them upon us through faith in Jesus. We have been saved and are abundantly blessed Brothers and sisters, because God loved us before time began. In eternity past, He set His love upon us by name and determined that He would save us from everlasting destruction by raising us from spiritual death and causing us to trust His Son, Jesus, for salvation. God chose us in Christ before He created the world. It is the Scripture that is before our eyes and has come upon our ears. It is the unalterable, eternal Word of God. And we need to rejoice in it. Why am I saved today? It is because God, before anything that is, God chose to set His love upon me. He chose to crucify His Son on a cross to save the likes of me. And He made that choice before the foundation of the world. This is divine election. Though there was nothing in me but that which called down His wrath, He elected to love me, to be merciful to me, to save me by grace through faith in His Son. God determined in before time began to wash us clean by the blood of His beloved Son so that we would be holy and blameless before Him for all eternity. Do you understand this? Anybody here do some things, say some things, think some, thing, think some things this week that embarrassed you? That you knew was sinful, dishonorable to God? I got to tell you that He has washed us clean by the blood of His beloved Son so that we, in His presence, are holy and blameless before Him for all eternity. That is not a license to sin, and no true believer wants to sin. His heart is toward holiness, and when he sins, he has stumbled into sin. He has gone momentarily on some ridiculous detour that will soon break his heart and remind him that he hates that sort of stuff, and he'll come back. God's people can't live in sin. This is not a license to sin. This is rejoicing territory for the people of God. As I struggle with sin, the flesh, and the devil, the blood of Christ, the righteousness of Jesus, prevails before the throne of God on my behalf. He is righteous forever with my name on His priestly garments. It's a beautiful thing. 
Look at Ephesians 1.5. So we have election, now we have predestination. This makes some people wiggle, wiggle, it ought to make the people of God rejoice. Ephesians 1.5, in love, that is that eternal love we've just talked about. He predestined us to adoption as sons through Jesus Christ to Himself, according to the kind intention of His will, to the praise of the glory of His grace, which He freely bestowed upon us in the Beloved, that is, in Christ God's beloved Son. And so first of all, it is divine predestinating love that has saved us. It is God determining that in time, at a certain point in time, He would draw me to His Son, Jesus Christ. I would absolutely believe. He would cause me to believe. And the Son would say, I will never cast you out. And I will raise you up on that day. You have eternal life. It is divine, predestinating love that has saved us. It is His everlasting, adopting love that has saved us and made us part of His eternal family. It is according to His kindness and the exercise of His unstoppable will that we have been saved. To God be the glory. Amen. In verse 6 is precious as well to the praise of the glory of His grace which He freely bestowed upon us in the Beloved. Oh, how we ought to praise Him and glory in His saving grace that He has freely bestowed upon us. His grace was not earned, it was bestowed. It was given as a gift, no strings attached. We enjoy every heavenly blessing imaginable because it has been gifted to us by faith in God's beloved Son. And where did the faith to believe come from? It's a gift from God. It's all of grace, lest any man should boast. And it's all because He chose us in Christ before the world began. Now in our Tuesday Bible studies, we're working through a little book called Drawn by the Father. And it's all about what this, it's about God taking the people, He says here in Ephesians 1, taking the people He chose to save in Christ and giving them to Jesus in John chapter 6, about verse 34 and following, giving them to Jesus so that He would go and die for them and redeem them. And God says to him, don't you lose even one. He says, you raise them all up on the last day. Do you understand? Chosen in Christ before the foundation of the world. Given to Christ. We are the people for whom He died upon the cross. He didn't die to make our salvation possible. He died to secure our salvation for all eternity. God commanded Him to save those people. And that's what He did. When He said, it's finished, my salvation was finished, even though I didn't know it yet. There was a point in time, and thank God for it, that I came to realize the whole thing. My sin, my need of the Savior, and I ran to Him crying out for salvation. But that too was God's work in me. Yes. Oh, how we ought to praise Him and glory in His, the saving grace that He has freely bestowed upon Him. We should praise Him for this truth that He chose us in Christ before the world began. And what did He see in us? Well, we've read about it, haven't we? And such were some of you. What was that? That was, that was adulterers and fornicators and homosexuals and murderers and, and, and liars. And the Bible's got an enormous list way beyond that. Who were you? A troublesome gossip? Womanizer? A man chaser? Who knows? I don't know and I don't care because the blood of Jesus has covered your sin and I don't need a report about it. Hmm. Well, look at verse 7. In Jesus, we have redemption through His blood the forgiveness of our trespasses according to the riches of His grace, which He lavished on us in all wisdom and insight. He made known to us the mystery of His will according to His kind intention, 
which he purposed in Jesus with a view to an administration suitable to the fullness of the times, that is, the summing up of all things in Christ, things in the heavens and things on the earth. In Jesus also we have obtained an inheritance, having been predestined according to his purpose, who works all things after the counsel of his will. Can I pause there a moment? You know what I'm going to say, don't you? Look at the two words, all things. What about all things? God works all things after the counsel of His own will. How does He do that? How can anything that happened today or tomorrow have anything to do with the will of God? It's because, looking back a line, He predestined it to happen. He determined in eternity past that history would unfold detail by detail, moment by moment, like this and like that. He is our sovereign God. He is our Father. He is our Creator. And He has brought to pass our salvation. I'm talking to believers here. I am not today preaching a gospel message with the hope of having someone converted. But nevertheless, though I speak to believers and I came to encourage your heart and to fill you with joy, the gospel is here. For all to hear. Even the unbelief. In Him you also. Now look at verse 12. To the end that. Or this is the, this is the reason He predestined you to salvation. The reason He has worked all things together to bring your salvation to pass. It's, it's because of the goal or the end that he had in mind. That we who were first to hope in Christ would be to the praise of his glory. We're saved not so we can boast, but so that we can open our mouths and point people to God. To thank him for it, to praise him for it. In Jesus you also, after listening to the message of truth, the gospel of your salvation, having also believed, you were sealed in him with the Holy Spirit of promise. Oh my goodness, I'm in the hand of God. I have been purchased by Jesus. I have been sealed by the Holy Spirit. I cannot be removed from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus. The seal of God is upon me. I've been stamped. And I can't, it can't be broken. You were sealed in Him with the Holy Spirit of promise who is given as a pledge or promise of our inheritance with a view to the redemption of God's own possession. Verse 15. For this reason I too, having heard of the faith in the Lord Jesus Christ which exists among you and your love for all the saints, I do not cease giving thanks for you. Now why does Paul give thanks to God instead of congratulating these people for believing in Jesus? Because salvation is impossible with men, but God has saved them and us by His electing, predestinating, adopting grace. Therefore, Paul says, I give thanks to God for saving you, for making mention of you in my, your, my prayers, that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give to you a spirit of wisdom and of revelation in the knowledge of Him. He says, I pray that the eyes of your heart may be enlightened, so that you will know what is the hope of His calling, what are the riches of the glory of His inheritance in the saints, and what is the surpassing greatness of His power toward us who believe. These are in accord with the working of the strength of His might, which He brought about in Christ when He raised Him from the dead and seated Him at His right hand in the heavenly places." far above all rule and authority and power and dominion, and every name that is named, not only in this age, but also in the one to come. And he put all things in subjection under Christ's feet and gave him as head over all things to the church, which is his body, the fullness of him who fills all in all. The Apostle Paul prays, as every pastor prays, that God would open the minds and understanding of His people to realize the truth about their salvation, the truths we look at this morning. 
that we are saved today because God set His love upon us before He created anything that is. He determined to sacrifice His Son for us and that God the Holy Spirit would raise us from the dead and cause us to believe in Jesus. Paul prays that his readers and all believers will come to understand what is the hope of God's calling or the hope that is ours since God has called us to faith in His Son. Well, beloved, we have the hope of everlasting life. We have the sure and certain hope that we will spend eternity in heaven with our God and Savior. We have the hope of complete sanctification, of an unending sinless existence before the face of God. What a, what a relief that will be to be free of all that the fall did to us. We have the hope of the resurrection. And yes, I will die. I will turn to dust. But at the second coming of Jesus, the trumpet will sound and the dead in Christ will rise with bodies that cannot die. And we will ascend into glory to be with Jesus forevermore. And then Paul prays that we will come to some understanding of our amazing inheritance. It is an inheritance reserved in heaven just for us. It is an inheritance that cannot pass away. It cannot be stolen. We can't use it up. It is inexhaustible and imperishable. And what is it exactly? Well, it's at least being in the presence of the Blessed Trinity forever without end. And I think there could be nothing more to ask for. But there is more. There's always more with God. And I tell you that eye has not seen and ear has not heard and has not entered into the heart of man all that God has prepared for those who love Him. It is a glorious inheritance that is ours. And now verse 19. And Paul prays that the believers in every age would come to understand what is the surpassing greatness of His power toward us who believe. These are in accord with the working of the strength of His might which He brought about in Christ when he raised him from the dead and seated him at his right hand in heavenly places. Now, do we suppose that our salvation was easily accomplished? No, we don't. That which was impossible with men has been accomplished by the strength of God's might. It took the God of eternity, the God who created all things, the strength of the great I Am was brought to bear upon our dead and damned souls. We could be saved in no other way. Paul tells us that God exercised the same power in saving us that He used to raise Jesus from the dead. You and I were spiritually dead, without hope, without God in this world. We were destined for hell, but God. But God loved us with this everlasting, electing, predestinating, adopting love. And He brought His limitless power to bear upon our hopeless condition. And He raised us from spiritual death. God reconciled to Himself, us to Himself by the blood and righteousness of Christ. God, the Creator and Owner of all that is, imposed eternal life upon us when we were His determined enemies. And we need to praise Him for it every day. To those who believe that God chose us because of something good He saw in us, let me read our opening text for you once again as we close. <laughs> Full of dead men's bones, I'm telling you. And you were dead in your trespasses and sins in which you formerly walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air and of the spirit that is now working in the sons of disobedience. Among them we too all formerly lived in the lust of our flesh, indulging the desires of the flesh and of the mind, and were by nature children of wrath, even as the rest. But God, being rich in mercy, before, because of His great love with which He loved us, even when we were dead in our transgressions, made us alive together with Christ. By grace you have been saved, and He raised us up, beloved, and seated us with Him in heavenly places. We're already seated in the heavenlies. Our resurrection and ascension into glory is so certain. The Bible speaks of it in past tense. So that. Now look at this. This is what your salvation was for. So that in the ages to come He might show the surpassing riches of His grace and kindness toward us in Jesus. So that. 
Humans from every age, as they stand before God to be judged and witness this vast group of people that have been redeemed. And so that the principalities and powers and the, the, the demons and the spirit beings could look and say, oh, there's John, you mean to tell me you saved him? How'd you do it? By the same power that it took to raise Jesus from the dead according to the riches of God's grace, that filthy man was saved. By grace you have been saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It is a gift of God, not as a result of works, so that no one may boast. Goodness sakes. Let us offer up a sacrifice of praise for the great salvation that God in mercy and love has bestowed upon us through faith in His beloved Son.